if you can all hear me. Welcome everybody to tonight's edition of Cold Water Capers brought to you by the Cape Long Distance Swimming Association. The CLDSA is an organization that promotes, records and supports long distance swimming in the Cape. Long distance being swims greater than 7.4 kilometers. The organization is over 50 years old and, and our records include over 3000 successful swims. Thanks to you all for attending tonight. Uh, we have a diverse audience of members and non-members here, quite a lot of non-members here. Um, so welcome to people in the UK, people in South Africa, people up also outside of the Cape region wow. and then people in Australia, it's 3.30 a.m. I see. So welcome. Uh, for those who aren't members, a reminder that membership is just 300 Rand. That's about, I think about 12 pounds or 15 euros. Um, uh, sign up on our website, www.cldsa.co.za and get complimentary tickets to our talks, uh, an invitation to the AGM, uh, discounted coaching, discounted speedo and orca and wear and officiation for your swim. The new season starts the 1st of July. So members will get correspondence uh, early next week about uh, um, uh, replenishing their membership. Um, in this series, we talked to a number of swimming icons. We've also focused on swimming and health and fitness. This week, we talked to the Voldemort of swimming world, and that is sharks. And who better to chat to us about these uh, incredible creatures than our very own Lee Denecker. So uh, Lee grew up in Johannesburg and her love for the ocean began after a 2009 stay in Mozambique where she worked as a scuba diving master. She then went to Rhodes University where, where she studied zoology, ichthyology and fishery science. She went on to graduate with honors and then masters in marine biology in Cape Town. She moved to Cape Town in 2014 and started research on the field of, um, on the feeding ecology of white, great white sharks and broad nose seven gill sharks in False Bay, all the time working as a shark diving guide as well. Lee has been working for the Two Oceans Aquarium for over five years. And whilst focused on sharks, she has broadened her knowledge to, to other sea life too. Lee has been a passionate advocate for sharks. She's a science communicator and speaker and has also co-hosted Shark Woman for Discovery Channel's Shark Week last year. Uh, when not working, you'll find Lee running across some of the many, many trails uh, and hiking paths of the Cape Peninsula and also swimming in the beautiful ocean. She, like many of us, is an open water swimmer. So what a privilege to have you. Welcome, Lee, and thanks for joining us. Just to say, we, um, we as usual, will be uh, running some questions at the end of the chat. Um, so feel free to uh, leave your questions in the chat board and I will get to all of them, some of them, uh, we'll see how we do. So apologies if we don't get to your question, um, but the time is a little bit limited. So we're going to start with a 10 minute intro uh, given by Lee, um, and then we'll get on to the interview. Over to you, Lee. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you to Moinine and the CLDSA for having me. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar names and some names I don't know, some I've been in the water with, others I hope I get to meet you soon. Um, but without further ado, I'm yet to talk to you about sharks. So I'm going to give you just a brief introduction on uh, just the diversity of sharks that we have. Um, Tom or Moinim, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so... Um, when we think of sharks, I'm sure you all have one particular species that springs to mind, and I have it up on screen there, the, the great white. Yeah. But what I would really, one of the things I'd like to emphasize to you today is the diversity that exists within sharks. So yes, the great white is an incredible animal, very charismatic, and it's earned the attention it gets. But there are approximately 500 different species of shark worldwide, and only about a handful of those are really considered to be harmful to people. 
Um, so we have just an example of the smaller shark. They come in all shapes and sizes, but this is the smallest one. It's called the dwarf lantern shark. You can see it's about 20 centimeters in, si in size, fits in a human's hand. And then the biggest one I'm sure many of you may know it eats plankton and it can reach up to 12 meters. That is the whale shark. So that's just the biggest and the smallest, but um, we have a lot of others in between and they occupy a diversity of habitats. So everything from your sandy bottoms to the pelagic deep open ocean, that's a blue shark. The coral reefs, sharks are incredibly important apex predators in a coral reef ecosystem. And then some of you may be familiar with our, our local kelp forest and um, I'll tell you a bit more about the, the sharks we find there. To go to some more extremes, you find sharks in the very cold water, some of the environments that, that I know a lot of you seem to enjoy for some reason. And um, this is a Greenland shark. Um, yeah, there's an example of a swimmer who seems to have an affinity for this kind of water. Um, the age, um, I'm gonna say that's more reflective of the shark than the human. <laughs> um, but the Greenland shark can actually reach an age of, of, of approximately 400 years old. So really, really impressive animals. And I hope Ryan Stramroot there reaches a similar age. Um, that would be great for me. Um, and then further extremes, we have some of the more deep sea sharks. So that is a six gill shark and it, it can go up to a kilometer underwater. And that's me, not a kilometer underwater, but I also enjoy the underwater environment. So just to share a little bit of the, the things we have in common with them, if you like. And then we also have some of the really, really weird looking ones. You might be familiar with the hammerhead shark. That is a goblin shark, really bizarre creature. And that over there is one of my favorites. Um, it, is, it is the thresher shark and a swimmer whose face I have seen all too often breathing next to me. That's cat person over there. I just had to put that picture above it just for, just for some fun. <laughs> I do love you cat very much. Um, but to go a little bit more locally, I know we've got some internationals here. Those of you who, um, know our waters and for those of you who don't, South Africa is a very incredible and very special place for sharks. So we have 114 of those approximately 500 species found in our waters alone. So having this really nice warm tropical ocean on our east coast transitioning into the cooler Western Cape waters really does create an incredible environment for a diversity of species. So South Africa is considered a top five global hotspot for shark and ray diversity. So we really do have special waters and, and waters that need protecting. Um, but what a privilege for us to spend the time that we do in this space. And a lot of the species, well, 16 of those species are endemic to our waters, meaning they're found nowhere else in the world. So some of the examples, which those of you that have swum in Cape Town may have been lucky enough to see that over there is the pajama shark very, very well named. Um, we also have its close relative, which is the leopard cat shark. The puff at a shy shark, really small little guy, uh, one of my favorites. And then the dark shy shark, very similar, but slightly darker in color. And the spotted gully shark, a little bit bigger. They're quite shy, but if you've been lucky enough to see one, they're very, very cool. Um, and these are these are some of our, our local species. But then we also may have heard of the, the bronze whaler shark, which is one of the bigger sharks that um, people may, may be a little bit concerned about, but we'll touch on that later. This species, I doubt any of you would have ever seen. I've only ever seen one, and that was at Robben Island. It is a critically endangered animal, heavily fished, unfortunately, harmless to people. Um, it's known as the soup fin or, or taupe shark. And this is one of my study species that Tom mentioned earlier, the broad-nosed seven-gill shark. So just to, um, that's all the fun stuff, but I'm just gonna highlight something very briefly as, and I'm sure many of you have heard, heard that sharks are incredibly misunderstood animals. So just think to yourselves in your head, if you had to put out a number, and this is approximate because it changes every year, but how many humans do you think are killed by sharks every year? And this is a global all over the world. How many people? So there you have approximately 10. So that will fluctuate from year to year. Ten. But if you have to look at the number of sharks that are killed by humans every year. Now, I know some of our political figures may not even be able to pronounce this number, but that is between 70 and 100 million sharks are killed by humans every year. 
And this is for a number of reasons. Um, overfishing and targeted catch are, are, are one of the main ones, but the main one is in fact bycatch. So a lot of these animals are really, really wastefully killed in, in fisheries. Uh, the shark fin trade is another one. Uh, plastic pollution, which I'm sure you know affects all our ocean life and habitat destruction is another one of those. Um, but just to touch off on my intro is sharks have been around, they've been on our planet for over 400 million years. So they were here before the dinosaurs and they continue to live long after the dinosaurs went extinct. They have survived five major extinctions. So the scary thing is, is are they going to be able to survive us? I mean, they are now considered amongst rhino and pangolin as one of the most endangered groups of species on earth. And the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, have actually assessed sharks and rays in South Africa to be 42% of ours are considered to be threatened, meaning they're either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. So um, just a bit of a note as to their diversity and also some of the threats they face, and that maybe they're not as scary <laughs> as you may have thought going into this. Um, but cool, let's discuss further. Thanks, Tom. Just finding my mute backs and thanks so much there, Lee. That's very, very interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I, before we get into some of the some of the juicy parts, I just want to ask you the question: Why sharks? Um, what got you into to to sharks? And why? What do you? What What's your message to the audience around why we should care more about sharks more than perhaps being scared about them in the water? Because, because. Um, okay. We'll do questions later. Okay, <laughs> so uh, that's a great question and I love getting that one. So what got me into sharks was actually just like I'm sure many of you or many people you may know, it started off with a ridiculous fear that I had. I was too scared to get in the water as a kid. I'd seen the movie Jaws and was just terrified by them. But over time, my mom actually, she can take the credit for being an avid scuba diver. She she wanted me to get in the water and experience what was what was below the waves. And I started scuba diving. And long story short, um, did a dive with bull sharks. And there I was in the water and this animal I kind of expected, well, thought I had to fear it was didn't want to hurt me and I just had to learn more. I had to figure out, okay, why isn't it hurting me? Why is everything I thought was real? That's not happening. So I went on to study them and in doing so, learned a lot about them, how fascinating they are, learned about their the threats they face, their vulnerabilities, but also just how important they are. And, and this might sound a bit, might sound ridiculous by putting it by, if I say it briefly, but sharks are incredibly important to our ocean environment and, and the ocean we depend on not only as a source of some of for some of the food we eat but also the phytoplankton in the algae that produces a lot of the oxygen in the air we breathe this is an ocean that we depend on for life and sharks are an incredibly important part of that so by removing sharks from the ocean environment causes a cascading effect throughout that ecosystem and if that if ocean ecosystems begin to collapse, it ultimately impacts an important food source for us, all the way down to the very air we breathe. And this is why we should care about them. Okay. No, no, ab absolutely fascinatingly. Um, you know, uh, I, I share a sort of similar story around getting interested in sharks uh, through, through scuba diving. And it's always uh, interested me that uh, for us swimmers, you know, the, just the, the idea of a shark gets us worried. Um, but uh, when you go scuba diving, you actually sometimes go hunting for them. And it's quite exciting to see them. So uh, sort of different attitudes there, just as an uh, observation. Um, so we talked a little bit about some of those sharks that we, we see in South Africa. Um, around the peninsula, if we just focus there for now, um, how many, how many uh, species? do you find around the peninsula and where are they really located is it more uh the false bay side or the atlantic seaboard um what 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 can you tell us about that so we 
the Cape Peninsula is an incredibly important space for sharks and, and we do host the diversity of shark species. And sadly, I think a lot of them actually try to hide away from us. You know, we're, we're more, they're more scared of us than, than we are of them a lot of the time. So some of the smaller species that are highlighted earlier, the pajama shark, puff at a shy shark and, and the like for those, those you will find um, in the kelp forest environments, um, but they're often um, the, the pajama sharks and leopard cat sharks in particular are nocturnal hunters. So they'll often be high, hiding in reefs and crevices and caves. So, so you're quite lucky if you do see one of those guys come out. Um, and they will occur all the way along both Atlantic seaboard and False Bay for all of the, the smaller species I highlighted. When it comes to some of the, the bigger species, um, the bronze whaler shark and um, the great white in particular, I'm sure we'll touch on, on, on those guys a bit later. Um, Unfortunately, not around much in False Bay at the moment. Well, around our, our cold um, Western Cape waters much anymore. But um, when they were around, <laughs> they were focused more in False Bay. Although there have been reported sightings of them on the Atlantic seaboard side, it was significantly less than in um, False Bay. False Bay hosts a seal colony, Seal Island, and that was predominantly the reason for white sharks visiting that area. Um, but for the most part, bronze whalers and white sharks, the bigger guys, um, they are more, definitely more uh, false bay side. Um, great whites, as much as they are adapted to both warm and cold water environments, they're very dynamic in the, the temperature tolerance they have. Um, they don't seem to like the cold water as much, uh, the, the very cold water. <laughs> so they can tolerate it for sure, but there's there's definitely a preference for, for, for slightly warmer water, unlike some of the people I'm speaking to today. <laughs> okay, and, and Liam, just on, on, so we know the great whites uh, obviously have got a reputation being r relatively dangerous. Uh, what about all the other sharks around, around the peninsula? You talked about, uh, the bronze whaler um yeah so I, I that that's there's a lot of stories about them i think a lot of surfers talk about about them and being quite fearful of them um is there reason to fear them so bronze whalers are pretty pretty big sharks and they are um they are apex predators in in the spaces that they occupy so uh, however, they are they are very cautious of humans. I, I would not. Um, it's not a species I would be concerned about. And um, bearing in mind, if these animals are in a space where they are feeding, if there are um, bait balls around and they are in kind of a hunting mode, if 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 you like, um, then I would avoid. I would avoid any species of shark really. Um, but when it comes to bronze whalers just cruising up and down the back line, um, I, I, it's not a, not a species I would be worried about. They, they are big and, you know, it's still a shark. It's still a predator and we, we owe them the level of respect that they deserve. But um, I would not be concerned about coming across one of them swimming outside of a feeding space. And the same is true for the broad nose seven gill, which is also a pretty big shark that we find in our waters, uh, predominantly in the kelp forests, although orcas seem to have chased them away too. Um, but yeah, the, the only the only big species that I would say we should perhaps just have exercise extensive caution around would be the would be the great white and they are not around much anymore. Yeah, so just on that, I mean, you mentioned also the orcas, um, and a lot has been written about it. I mean, in the in the media, um, let's let's get it from uh, the horse's mouth, so to speak. But the, uh, you know, what is where, where are we currently with the orcas? Um, are they chasing the the great whites away, or is that the best hypothesis we have for now? Uh, are they likely to stay away? Is this a see? Is this a cyclical thing that means that they'll come back later or like a lot in the ocean we just don't know uh, yeah it, it, it's quite a hot topic at the moment um the the sharks versus orca saga um and it's it's still kind of ongoing and you know with a lot of these things in nature uh, us as marine biologists unfortunately the the research just can't keep up with the rate at which nature is changing but there is now, after eight years after the first documented 
predation of, um, well, evidence for predation of orcas on sharks was in 2015. And that was firstly in False Bay at Millers Point on the broad nose seven gill sharks. Millers Point used to be a hot spot for those animals. You could go scuba dive there with up to 47 gills around you. It was, it was quite special. I would spend every day I could there, particularly in the summer months. Um, and then as they are infamously known, port and starboard, the two orcas with their collapsed dorsal fins, um, they came in and the seven gills, we, we retrieved a few carcasses and after um, doing autopsies on it determined that, well, we realized that it, it was likely orcas. This has been debated for many years whether or not the orcas were in fact the culprit, but recently there was footage taken in Mossel Bay which showed direct evidence from a drone of orcas hunting, catching, and killing a great white. So, and, and this, this was in Mossel Bay, it's happened in Khan Spy with great whites, it's also happened with seven gills in um, Khan Spy, and it's also been recorded in other parts of the world on other species of sharks. So this might seem like a unique thing to us here in South Africa, because it is quite new. We, before this, we didn't know False Bay without great whites. Um, whereas now we, we barely hear of them and the, and the only, and there is now actually evidence, there's scientific publications that are out there, um, there's drone footage showing that, and even from sharks that have been tagged, you can immediately see when the orcas have been sighted, those tagged sharks just disappear from the areas where the orcas were sighted. So there is extensive evidence for the orcas being the, the primary reason for great whites moving out of an area. However, they are being increasingly seen in places from Plettenberg Bay, even into KZN in Aliwal Shoal, Sidwana Bay, divers are seeing great whites, um, East London, which um, was as much as they, they are very tolerant and they do occur in those waters, um, there does seem to be a shift of them into, into the warmer waters where there's less um, visitations, if you like, from, from those, those orcas. Just on the um, just on the great whites anyway. Before they went away, I mean, were, was there any seasonal behaviour? Did they did did you find them more in the winter in 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 around around the peninsula, and then they went up the coast, the east coast, uh, um, you know, during the summer? I don't know. Uh, was there any is there any seasonal activity? So I mean, is there a time that you look out for them as opposed to other times? Um, yes, so, so great whites definitely between um, in areas along our coastline where we do have predominant seal colonies. So False Bay, Hans Bay and Mossel Bay are the three kind of historically speaking, at least let's call it pre orca. Um, the white sharks would typically hunt seals in the winter months. So just a little bit of background. The seal pups are usually born at the end of the year. So November, December, and then they'll feed off their mothers for the first six months. So fast forward to June, July, those seal pups will start getting in the water for their first time learning to swim and, and hunt for themselves. Um, the white sharks have now adapted to, to use that because these predator naive seals are, are relatively easier prey. For a white shark to catch an adult seal is incredibly difficult. I'm sure many of you have seen that magnificent animal, how they launch themselves out the water. That takes a lot of energy. A lot of those breaches are unsuccessful. So they need to adjust their entire movement patterns to make it worthwhile, that hunting effort. So they target the seal pups who are swimming. So that's around winter. Then in the summer months, they move, so they'll stay within those respective bays, some of them at least, and they'll move to the inshore areas where you have a lot of, um, in the summer months, there's a lot of yellowtail and migra migratory fish and other species of shark that'll cruise along the inshore areas. So some of you may remember um, shark spotters would often put out warnings in the summer months, just saying be cautious of using the water in the summer along the main beaches because there's more people getting in the water because it's warmer, but there's also increased shark activity in those more inshore areas because that's where their food is moving. So they're not moving there for us. They would move there because that's where their food is. Um, so there is very much a seasonal pattern. This is how it was in these particular areas, um, pre-orca, um, whereas now it's anyone's guess what they're doing. White sharks are known from international studies to spend a large part of their time offshore. 
So these are ocean travelers. Some of you may have heard of the, the great white Nicole that was tagged in South Africa, swam to Australia in three months, and then swam back to South Africa. <laughs> so this is, isn't the rule. They don't all do that. Um, but some of them will do massive, massive oceanic migrations. Others will hang around more locally and some of them will go offshore to, we have no idea where, where, where white sharks mate or where they reproduce. Um, so there's a good chance this can be happening out in the open ocean. Um, we're just familiar with them in our space, false bay in particular, around that seal colony for, for food. All right, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Lee. I think we well uh, because we've got a lot of swimmers on. Of course, um, I think we want to just talk a little bit about it. You being sort of obviously the the, ocean, the the shark expert, but also being an open water swimming. You've got that open water swimmer. You've got that sort of uh, swimmer uh, sort of uh, side of things that you can actually look at uh, how we view view sharks. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna pull up something very quickly. Um, see if it comes up so we're going to do lee's top shark tips when ocean swimming around the cape peninsula okay so just want to talk i've got some got some things we pre-prepared and so we're just going to talk through them um the first thing is uh you, you're a swimmer you, you come to a new environment um you want to get in the water uh what should you do and you're a bit worried about sharks what should you do Lee? So, yeah, as um, Tom's got written there, learn about your environment. This is incredibly important, and, and I'm sure many of you may know this, and not just pertaining to sharks, pertaining to safety in general. Get an understanding about everything you can. What is in the water? Is there potentially something that can hurt you? I mean, there on a lot of these beaches, you have lifeguards there um, in Cape Town in particular we have the shark spotters which have an amazing they're out there every day they have a, lo a lot of knowledge so ask them what's out there what have you seen have you seen any sharks what sharks have you seen just get as much information as you can about the environment you're stepping into before you make that informed decision as to whether or not it's it's a good idea to do so all right next um yeah, so uh, this is this is an interesting point that's come up before. Uh, you know, the, um, I remember there used to be a lot of races out in uh, the false Bay side about ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and then suddenly there was a there was a couple of attacks, um, and all the races dried up, and uh, if, if you saw everybody swimming on the cold side. Um, the, there is a theory that the Atlantic seaboard is is safer. Is this uh, indeed true? So as I mentioned earlier, you, you know, we, we've got to be aware that the, the ocean has no boundaries for these animals, so they will move as they please, but it's all relatively speaking. And as I mentioned, False Bay was very much a, a place where sharks would go for food, whereas the Atlantic seaboard, it's not a, it's not a hunting hotspot for them. The water is a bit colder, which is not their favorite as much as they can tolerate it. Um, if we're talking relatively, um, I would definitely say the Atlantic seaboard is safer. However, we're also talking pre-Orca, <laughs> where now False Bay doesn't seem to have many of them, if any of them, sadly, around anymore. Um, yeah. Well, all right. Uh, next one. Um, so swimming alone, swimming in groups. Uh, we always say swim with a buddy. It's a good idea. Um, is it does, it? does that pertain to sharks and uh, being safer? Definitely. And I mean, we've seen it. Uh, I spent many years working at Seal Island when the, when the great whites were still around. The, the sharks would very, very rarely target big groups of seals. It was almost 99% um, of their predations would be on a single lone seal on its own. Um, swimming in groups, it can confuse them. It's disorientating for them. It's it's difficult to isolate one target, so so they will go for an isolation, isolated target. Um, and I mean, I suppose it's the same if you think of hunt, hunting lions or any animal hunting. They will they will single out. Um, it just makes it easier for them. Um, but again, I just I just want to emphasize while we're on this. Remember, these encounters are they're very rare. We just we're just looking at things. This is being overly cautious, being overly safe, and just just making sure that we, but these animals are not 
not out to get you. <laughs> I'm just going to put that disclaimer there to start with. <laughs> Okay, um, then just just another thing. Uh, so I put shark shields. I don't know what maybe that's a trade name, but uh, we've got uh, uh, you know shield shield uh, shark deterrents. We haven't talked today about that that special sense that sharks have in their nose, to, uh, picking up electric uh, signals. But um, there are shark shields on boats. There are shark shield little wristbands that people wear or ankle bands that they wear. Um, do, is there is there a thought whether these things are, are are really work well or work a little bit or we're not sure or um, or some things work and some things don't work? Yeah, it, the shark shields are an interesting one, and um, the the concept behind these is to, as you mentioned, Tom, they've got these electro. Well, sharks have all the senses that we do. Um, except they have two extra, which are, I like to consider basically superpower sensors. So on their nose, they've got these, um, what we call the ampullae of Lorenzini, very fancy name, but they've got these, these pores, these little pores on the, on the tips of their nose, and it's filled with an, an electric conductive gel. And what that allows them to do is to pick on any electric currents in the water. This helps them look for their prey it also helps them avoid predators or anything that could be a threat to them. Um, they've also got another sense that's called the lateral line. So running along the length of their body, fish have it as well. Um, it allows, it's linked to their hearing, but it allows them to pick up on any vibration. So any like a struggling fish or anything moving in the water, they can actually feel that. So the concept of the shark shield, it's designed to overwhelm those senses. So it's an incredibly sensitive place for them. So you may have heard that if you, you know, if you come into contact with a shark, a really hard like hit on the nose or poke in the eyes or in the gills, targeting sensitive areas. So the shark shield is designed to target that sensory system. So to almost overload it to the point that the shark gets uncomfortable and moves away. So that is that is the idea behind it. Um, as to whether or not they work, there isn't enough evidence to show that they do, but there also isn't enough evidence to show that they absolutely don't. So I know that doesn't really <laughs> prove to be too helpful to everybody, but um, yeah, I, I would I would say there's still a lot of science and information that's needing to go into these to say that they work 100% without a doubt. Um, the lack of encounters that people may have had wearing shark shields could just be because you know sharks aren't actively after people <laughs> not necessarily that because they were wearing a shark shield um, but unfortunately from a science point of view there just isn't quite enough to prove that it does or it doesn't um, I don't think it'll do any harm wearing them um, and if it gives you a, a sense of peace of mind then then, then great um, but I won't um, I, I don't think there's enough to say it's foolproof Oh, great. Um, yeah, let the, date, the debate continue. Um, so I'm just, I'm just conscious of, of time. Just everybody, if there are any qu questions, there have been some questions that have been put in. We've, we've tried to answer some of them uh, already, but uh, any more questions, please uh, add them to the chat and we'll just get through these uh, last couple of points um, and then we'll get on to those. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned avoid places where they feed. Uh, any shark could be potentially dangerous if you... Uh, uh, if you start decide to sw swim during a you know um, during feeding time, I suppose. Well, I don't know about you, Tom, but I mean, if I'm eating and somebody interrupts me, I'm typically not very happy either. <laughs> but um, no, on a serious note, this is a very very important one, and this is where, uh, uh, as in Cape Town, where we have the shark spotters, which is such a such a lovely thing to have because these people will watch, and if they see a lot of fish activity or dolphins are feeding or whatever there's a good chance that there could be sharks in that area so so they really do give you a good indication as to whether or not it's a good idea to get into the water and if there's any place where where sharks could be feeding just rather rather just be on the safe side um, sharks do go into a bit of a different state of mind or a different mode when there is food in the water so um yeah uh, 
a shark that's feeding versus a shark that's just swimming around relaxed, it's it's a different animal. So mm. places where they feed, I would 100% say avoid. Even 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 a pajama shark, a little humble, tiny pajama shark. When I'm sure some of you have seen my octopus teacher. Mm. When that little guy's hungry, he gets he gets quite stuck in. So 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 just be respectful of these animals. You know, you're not gonna go mess with your dog while it's eating either. So these guys are no different. And then this one, this uh, age-old one, dusk, dusk and dawn, is that a sensible time to go uh, swimming? Is a 6 a.m. a little uh, swim, like, like most of us have done from time to time, or a sundown a swim, which is so wonderful in this part of the world. Is that a good idea? Look, again, we, we need to assess all of these together. So, you know, you, you look at each one independently, but also all together. And, and swimming dusk and dawn in, in a place where we do have a lot of, let, let me put it this way, eight years ago, pre-Orca, I would not swim in False Bay in dusk and dawn. I don't feel like it would have been worth the risk. Um, sharks, when, when we would um, go look to witness that natural predation, that breach, we'd go out to Seal Island before sunrise because that's typically when the sharks were hunting. So they use that low light condition, uh, low light conditions as an opportunity to ambush their prey. So there's just enough light for them to be able to see, but not enough necessarily for their prey to see them. So you've actually got a beautiful picture there, Tom, where you can see that that shark has a very dark top and a very light bottom. So that's something we call counter shading and that's, that's linked to their camouflage. And in those low light conditions, if you are above that animal and you're looking down, that black back or that dark gray back is almost invisible to the bottom. Whereas something that's swimming below that shark would be looking up at that white belly against the low light from the surface and it would be almost invisible. So they really are adapted to, to do what they do and perfectly well. And like I said, these animals have evolved. They've been here long before the dinosaurs existed. So these adaptations are, are quite impressive. So. They use this and the low light conditions as a, a time to hunt. So, and, and this is linked to your next one, Tom, I see murky water, same thing. They've got those superpower sensors that they don't need to be able to see here or smell you because they can feel something is there, you know, so they, they can feel something in the environment. And if they can't see well, it's less of an opportunity, you know, if they can see you, they can identify you and identify that you are not food. Whereas in low light, they might, the only way for them to find out would be to, to come and um, have a feel with, with their mouths. But, but again, I'm going to emphasize it more than once that this is not what these animals are aiming to do. They are not after you. There's a good chance some of them may have cruised below you without you even knowing about it. Um, these are in exceptional circumstances, and these are just safety tips for your peace of mind and just to accept that these are not malicious monsters, they are not man eaters, but they are curious predators. And um, I think if there's something I can leave you with, it's that. All right, Lee, um, we'll just jump to some questions so that my last point was going to be, um, yeah, I mean, the great white being the, the one that really is dangerous in these waters. There are others in, in other waters. Uh, and then I think uh, Ryan uh, brought up something that's quite interesting. Uh, you know, it's all very well preparing to be uh, careful as possible, but if, if and when one might find um, a great white and one's out alone or even in a group, um, uh, what are the do's and don'ts? Are there some do's and don'ts? What I mean, you can't really do much. You can't swim faster than them. Um, should you stand still? Should you prepare to attack it? Should you not splash? Should you splash? Um, is there anything that we know that it works or wouldn't work? Look, I think if, if you had to encounter an animal like that on the swim, I think the best thing you want to do is try to keep your eyes on it. Watch its movements. If it is coming towards you and you are concerned, aim for those sensitive bits, like I mentioned earlier. The nose is very sensitive. If you can, you can give it a hard knock on the nose or even in the eyes or the gills, wherever you, I mean, if you're in any kind of position to do so, that will very, very likely deter them. Um, chances are, if you've seen it and it's coming to check you out, it's, it's probably not going to hurt you, but um, that will be a proper way to deter it. Don't splash around. Don't don't try swim away, out swim it. You're never going to get that right. Rather keep your eyes on it and watch what it's doing because the, the better you can see it, the better you have a, a position to react from. Um, but minimal splashing, preferably. 
Okay, and then uh, I mean, uh, there was there again. You, we we chatted about it earlier that that attack in Egypt. For if those who didn't hear about it, there was a tiger. Was it a tiger shark attacked uh, um, a swimmer in, in Egypt or somebody in Egypt? And uh, um, the question is: Are most shark attacks just bad luck? Um, are they uh, um, are they sharks that think it's a seal and then they they grab it and then they realize it's not a seal? Um, or don't we know, or a mixture of them? Yeah, the, the, the recent encounter in Egypt is, is quite an anomaly. And, and I mean, the, the fact that there was, there was video footage around it, um, I think my bigger issue is just the insensitivities that humans have to be able to, to share that. Um, but the, the circumstances around that particular encounter, um, it, it appears that they were running some irresponsible ecotourism operations in that space where people who were um, without permits and licenses were going out and chumming the water to get sharks for people to see them. Um, in this particular instance with this guy, it appears to have just been a really, really bad luck thing. He happened to be in that space. But by kind of creating an area where sharks were coming in to, to be fed all the time by people, that animal may have had an association with that human that was potentially not the best. Um, the, the, the sad part of that is that a boat actually went out and they proceeded to brutally kill that shark, which, you know, <laughs> it, it, it makes you sometimes question, you know, that shark is just doing what it does in its space and it was unfortunate and the, and the guy was not actually eaten despite what despite what the media said he was bitten and he did sadly lose his life there there, there were um there were remains that were cremated but um it's a lot of the time it is mistaken identity a lot of the time it can be linked to that like we said any space where there's bait or feeding or whatever they are different animals and if you're not trained to be in an environment with those animals when there is bait around you shouldn't be there and if you're not with a reputable operator that knows what they're doing you should you know tourism operator you should also avoid that space um but a lot of the time it is just bad luck it, it, it really is just wrong place at the wrong time and again you got a curious predator coming to check you out they don't necessarily mean to um and i mean if you, you look at i'm going to say this quite quickly but if you look at animal you know a lot of these shark encounters people sadly often um if they lose their life it's due to a loss of blood so people you hear of losing an arm or a leg you very very hear, seldom hear of a person being fully consumed by the shark it's very rare um but think about it. If, if you don't know what something is, something's unfamiliar in your space, how do you learn more about it? So you're going to use your senses. You're going to look at it. You're going to smell it. I mean, look at kids. They put everything in their mouths. Mm -hmm. Sharks don't have that ability So to, to at least feel. Um, so if the water visibility is not good and they feel something or they come in, oh, what is that? What could it be? The only way to really learn is to take a bite. And a lot of the time, it's a mistake. And that's why, <laughs> unfortunately, they are just equipped to do a lot of damage, even though that's not their intention. They know what their prey is, and that's their target. It's, it's not us. We just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And unfortunately, People do lose their lives, but what, what's also sad is these animals are given a terrible reputation in the process, um, especially if you look at those stats that I mentioned relative what what humans are doing to them. And that's by choice, <laughs> which is which is brutal. Yeah, I'm mean, going on. I've, I think uh, there's another question here around uh, you talked about uh, dangerous predators, um, orcas. I think many years ago, you might remember there was a, an attack in SeaWorld in the US where uh, um, these trained uh, uh, orcas um, suddenly, or a trained orca suddenly attacked its uh, trainer. Um, so that, you know, presumably orcas are dangerous. I mean, in the wild, um, should we be worried about orcas out there, um, you know, minding their own business? Um, or uh, or do, we just, do we just mind our own business and get on with our swim? Um, so yes, that incident in SeaWorld was 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 quite hectic, but um, there's never been a document of orcas killing a human in the wild. Um, it's only ever been in a captive space, and I mean, in a, in a, those those are not animals that should be kept in captivity. So they are 
um, that's an animal that's very stressed. Um, and it was just reacting in a way that, yeah, it, it's an anomaly. But in the wild, I have seen countless and the most incredible footage. I think it was shared on one of the, the groups, the, the full space swimming group this, this week of a lady swimming with, with orcas all around her coming to check her out. They are incredibly intelligent animals, those. And then I think they know we are not, we are not on the menu for them. Um, I don't think we taste as good as we seem to think we do. Um, these, these animals are really not out to get us. Um, but I, I would not be concerned about an orca in the wild. But with that being said, any animal in the wild is a wild animal, and, and there should always be a level of caution taken around them. Um, but no, I think I think that would actually be a, a, quite a fantastic experience, in fact. So we should, I've, if I just leave off with this, so uh, we should not fear seeing sharks, but we should fear not seeing sharks, right? Um, um, yeah, I think, uh, Lee, yeah, I've sort of come to the end of the talk and uh, just wanted to mention that you have an important swim plan, not in these waters, but uh, in waters far away. Uh, do, won't you tell us a little bit about it? Um, yeah, so uh, very exciting. I'm getting to swim in some warm water. <laughs> but over the last few months, I have done a fundraiser. I'm currently working for the Wild Trust. Um, so I no longer work for the aquarium. For the last seven months, I've been working for the Wild Trust um, under their Wild Oceans program, where I'm working with an amazing team where we're trying to secure protection for sharks and rays in South Africa. And a large part of that is contributing to a global goal, which is to expand our marine protected areas by 30%, um, our global marine protected areas by 30%. So some of you may or may not know our current marine protected area in South Africa is only 5.4% of our waters are marine protected areas. So we would like to contribute more to that global goal and, and enhance our marine protected areas. So I'm working with a team that are trying to look for areas that are important around our coastlines, particularly for sharks and rays. And in, in doing this and in running this project, um, I'm doing a fundraising swim. It's called the Oceans Aid Charity Swim. It's later this week. I'm flying to Durban on Thursday. And I have I'm going to be swimming eight miles. Um, so each of the eight miles I'll be swimming, I've dedicated to a threatened um, shark or ray that we find in our, uh, and some of which that we, um, some of which are endemic, so only find in our waters. So. Um, I would love to ask if anybody is, if you've got a, a little bit of money to spare to, to contribute to the swim, it would really mean a lot to me to go towards the conservation efforts in, in trying to preserve these animals um, that, are, that are important in, in an ocean that we love and that we like to use. Um, yeah, I'd really, really appreciate it. So I do have a link. If you would like to read more on what I'm doing or more on the project, um, you can also follow me on Instagram. I've shared an extensive amount of information on each of the species that I've chosen to, to do this one for. And um, yeah, if anybody is able and, and willing um, to please donate, the swim is this weekend, well, this Friday, actually. So um, yeah, I'll only be able to, to, I've got a few more days left. So I've just posted the link um, for those to read more, but, but that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. And then, yeah, you you can be found on all uh, um, all major um, socials, uh, Lee Denecker. Um, by yeah, I'll get, I'll type there. in my my Instagram Thanks. handle there if anybody would like to to check that out. I'm most most active on Instagram, um, sharing pretty much a lot of sharks, a little bit of swimming, and a little bit of running. So if anybody's interested, you're welcome to check that out. And if and if you would like to. Um, to drop me a message if any questions weren't answered or you were a little bit too nervous to answer you you're more than welcome to um, drop me a message on instagram I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as i can so at this stage i'd like to thank lee uh thank you for generously giving us your time and uh and, and that little presentation as well and sharing all that information that i find it fascinating i hope you all did so thanks for your time and good luck for that swim uh, at the the end of this week um yeah th thank you thank you all for joining us this has been another cold water capers uh we'll hopefully be back uh in the next couple of months or so remember your uh your your subs are due um first of july you'll we'll be in contact with you shortly i'd like to also thank the 
producer, Manine, um, she puts this all together. I just uh, do the presentation. Um, so thank you, Manine, for uh, getting a really interesting topic uh, uh, that um, I think we got good, good, good attendees. So thank you, everyone, for coming along. And we'll see you next time or in the water. Right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lee, as always. And thank you, everyone. See you in the water soon and have a good evening. <laughs>